Okay, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. You know, welcome to our, our webinar, Test Solutions for the 400G Data Center Evolution. Um, my name is uh, Case Professor. I'm responsible for, for marketing at, uh, at Multilane. So the format of today's webinar is going to be, we'll have a um, presentation first, uh, and the second half is going to be a, a live demo you know, to make it a little bit more more interesting, and um, we'll have we'll try to answer some some questions uh, towards the end uh, of the session. In the meantime, if you have any questions, you know, just use the Q and A button uh, in in the Zoom uh, dialogue, so you, we can try to answer them live, or or keep some of the uh, the good questions till the end to uh, to uh, respond to them live. Okay. second all right so why are we having a, a conversation about uh, 400g today um you know the um, the industry the, the data center interconnect technologies have evolved very significantly over the last decade if you look, look at the 30s you know like 10 years ago they were at 10g right now we are at the you know the 50g which is the mainstream technology the kind of the pem4 26 gigabyte. Uh, the optics MSAs have evolved from QSFP, QSFP plus, now to QSFP DD and OSFP as being kind of the mainstream uh, optics MSAs. And the port speeds, you know, have evolved from from 10, 40G to 200. And really now we're seeing a, a big push for uh, for 400G. Um, you know, the 100G market is still really strong. Uh, there's large volumes, but we can see that the volumes are declining uh, a little bit, which is really a telltale that, of course, the next wave is really happening in full force. And the 400G ports are really starting to ship in, in, in large volumes. They really started last year. This year is going to be even more and really at the beginning of a big wave of 400G. And as you can see on this slide, you know, light counting um, presented some numbers uh, to really show that in 2020, you know, the market for 400G really started and we're really at the beginning of a, of a big uh, growth uh, wave. So obviously, you know, 400G going to, to volume deployment, you know, put some challenges to the, to the ecosystem. So that's why we're having a conversation today. You know, what are the challenges uh, if, you, if you look at, into volume deployment, but more importantly, what are the solutions that can enable uh, this uh, technology adoption? So let's start on the host side. Before you start plugging a system together, there's a couple of things that you probably want to check on the, on the host port side. So, so first of all, is your host port able to deal with the thermal stress that you that, that is caused by the by the, the transceiver? You know, is the signal integrity okay if if you plug in a, a transceiver or CMOS uh, CMOS interoperability? If you plug in an, an optics module. Uh, can the module be recognized? Is there going to be a handshake? And is the module properly going to be initialized? Uh, another part is the, the compliance of the port. So is the, the host port really spec compliant? But also, is it robust enough to deal with a variety of operating conditions? And is there some margin uh, to speak of so that you can really do the work that you need to do? Uh, and then last but not least, if you have a port which is suspicious, how are you going to troubleshoot it? How are you going to debug it to understand what the problem is? So let's start with the port um, validation. So, you know, there's a couple of things that you want to do before you can go live. So first of all, does a port recognize a transceiver? You know, is, is, is the CMOS, does it work properly? Is the signal integrity okay? You know, if, if, if you know, obviously if your traces are impaired, that will cause some problems for your um, for your for your optics or for your uh, for your, for your pluggable, uh, but also can your system deal with the power load of the of the transceiver? So we developed a tool. It's it's a loopback or thermal load um, module that really loops back the signal from the transmitter to the receiver, so it can test the signal integrity. It's entirely MSA compatible. It has programmable power dissipation and can be fully customized to act exactly 
like deployables that you use in your system. So this is a great, uh, you know, uh, test tool to really see whether you can, whether the, the, the system is going to work when you start plugging in modules. This is very important for, uh, for system deployment. So this, this loopback module really acts and behaves as a pluggable and this is really designed for testing uh, the system. So then the other thing is like the seamless compliance. We talked a little bit about it. So we developed adapters and seamless analyzers. So basically that allows you to validate that the implementation of the seamless is, is spec compliant. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're starting to execute commands, we have developed a GUI so that you can actually visualize the state machine to make sure that the command execution is, is properly. And of course, you can also you know, program the modules through this interface. We support three modes of operation. One is a standalone test mode for a pluggable or a standalone test mode for the host, but also it can act as a sniffer where you can basically visualize the low speed uh, transactions that are occurring. So should there be a problem, you now can see why there is a problem and you can start resolving it. So very important for, for seamless uh, compatibility. If you need to have access to your, to your high speed signals from the host, you know, we developed host compliance boards. They're, they're, they're very important. So it's, it's, it's basically a test fixture that plugs into uh, the host board and has really good signal integrity. And now you can basically use this in combination with test equipment. You know, you can use a BERT, you can use a, a, a TDR, um, or, or maybe an oscilloscope to test the high-speed interface. So this, this is really important for high-speed testing. And this, because this will allow you to do a couple of other things that are really critical. So we talked about this, the, the port being spec compliant. So obviously what you can do is you can plug in an, an, an a, a host compliance board connected to a BERT, you know, send in some data, put it in loopback mode and see what kind of data you get back. Is there any kind of, is there like a bit error rate? So obviously that's pretty, pretty straightforward, but now what you can do, you can also do some margin testing. So you can lower the amplitude, you can add some, some impairments like, like ISI, um, you can add some transmit equalization variations, and also very importantly, some additional stress to get a kind of a closed eye situation. And in our birds, we have a feature which is, is, is noise injection. So you can basically emulate crosstalk noise and, and send a impaired signal to your receiver. And then you can see how robust your port is to be able to deal with this. So what kind of margin does your host port have? It's very important if you want to understand how it's going to behave in a real life uh, environment. So then last but not least, um, you have a suspicious port. What are you going to do? So Again, use the HCB in combination with a TDR uh, time domain ref reflectometer. Uh, you send in a pulse or step, and then you can have a look at the impedance profile. So based on simulations, you know what the impedance profile of your port should look like. And it's really kind of a fingerprint of your port. You can see what it looks like. Is it deviating from your expectation? You know, it, it gives you very fine resolution um, capability to see you know, what kind of Im impedance mismatches you have to really understand what is happening with your port and start doing the, the troubleshooting. Yeah, so let's now turn to the, to the, to the pluggable. So there's a couple of things that are really critical here. So we talked about, of course, the, the, the seamless validation. Uh, is, is that all going to work? We talked about it in the, in the host session. Um, what about compliance? Is your pluggable Compliant. And, and remember, we are now in, in a volume deployment situation. So it's not that you have the, the luxury to go to your R&D lab, but you, know, you need to have a quick test to test for compliance of either your optics or your, your, your DAC cables. Then the next phase would be like, well, as kind of incoming inspection, validation of your supplier, do some corner testing, uh, subjected to temperature extremes, uh, or, or some, some uh, variations in the power supply to see what the behavior is. So it's very critical to prepare for that. And then last but not least, there's a couple of things that are really critical. Um, obviously power consumption is, is more important than ever. Um, and, and being able to, to, to test the link and optimize the link 
with the you know with fine resolution transmit equalizer and receiver equalizer to really understand where can I find the optimum uh, performance with the lowest power consumption is very critical. And then the other part is, you know, PAM4 is really a different beast. You know, it has four levels as opposed to the, the, the NRG110 one, one levels. Um, and links are not going to operate properly. Most links because of the reduced signal to noise ratio without forward error correction. So you need to really understand, you know, your, your FEC behavior to get an understanding of your of the true performance of your of your link and also of the elements that are part of that link. So what we did to to enable these this kind of testing is we have a, a fully automated uh, transceiver test solution. It's called ML7007. You know it's basically a combination of, 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 of equipment like a bird and oscilloscope optical switch box. It's all connected together. It comes with a single GUI it's a click of the button, you get a pass-fail test report of the optics. And it's really important, obviously, you know, normally this would really require an optics PhD to do this kind of testing, but we put it in a single, a single GUI to get a pass-fail test re uh, report. And, and the main thing that we test here is, is really the optical line side and the receiver sensitivity with a waterfall curve to really understand, okay, what is the behavior of this of this uh, transceiver, is it is it spec compliant? Of course, the same for a, a deck cable. You know, this is like a, a passive copper cable, very important in the data center. Um, you know, although the the parameters that you test this with are different, so these are kind of S parameters like the insertion loss, return loss, crosstalk, and so on. So we also developed an automated tool for this. So this is a bunch of TDR boxes with a, a, a single GUI. Uh, again, single push of a button, you get a test report with pass fail. It also provides the channel operating margin, which of course is kind of an, an, an additional uh, advanced parameter that is really critical uh, for, for DAC cables. Um, so if you're considering to start using AECs and, A and, and ACCs, uh, please uh, stay tuned for uh, some new solutions that we're going to uh, reveal very, very shortly. So to be able to test um, pluggables, you need to have a module compliance board. So a module compliance board is really critical. Every lab should have one. Um, it, ge it gives you access to the high speed signals, the transmitter and receiver with the spec compliant uh, interface, the VSR interface but it also gives you access to the low speed interface. So you can control the module, you can write to its memory. You know, there are some, some sensors built in to get, get some additional visibility. So this is a really important test tool to be able to, uh, to test pluggables, whether it's a optics, it's a, it's, it's a DAC or AOC. Um, and we have a, of course, QSFP, DD and all the typical MSAs for this uh, ecosystem. So now leading up to the, to, the, uh, to the demo, there's a couple of things that are really critical, uh, you know, for, for, for 400G, uh, you know, for, especially for PAM4. PAM4, op, PAM4 electrical, PAM4 optics is just, is, is a different beast and has some, some, some key challenges. So we already talked about the, the, the power consumption issue. Uh, you really want to, to use as, as little power as possible because it really adds up. There's like hundreds of thousands of these connections. So having a tool that gives you really fine control over the transmit equalizer, the receiver equalizer, and to understand what the link performance is as a result of that is really critical for this kind of optimization. And, and of course, with the, with the birds that we have and the, uh, for instance, a, a module compliance board, you can do this for the module side uh, with in, a bird in combination with a host compliance board, you can do this uh, on the switch side. So you can do the switch optimization. So that, that's the first uh, very important step. Then the other thing that we talked about is, 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 is FEC. So um, if you have a, a limited signal to noise ratio, uh, that really means that you're going to get some errors, which, which, which is fine. Uh, forward error correction is going to resolve that. So most PAM4 links will use a forward error correction uh, to, to stabilize the, uh, the link. So having a tool 
it gives you visibility, clear visibility on your fact statistics, like you know the correctable, uncorrectable code word count of your symbol error rate um, histogram. It's really important to do this uh, this kind of analysis, and 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 also something which is really critical is you know fact emulation is one thing, but if you really want to understand what the true performance is, you probably want to have the same fact implementation that the IC, which is in the in, in the switch fabric, uh, also has. So we have that kind of integration uh, of implementation in our bird with a real hardware fact that gives you the true figure of merit uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the link. So and then last but not least, if you, if you want to subject you know, you're, you're pluggable to uh, some multi-corner testing, um, you know, mostly temperature, you know, just give it some temperature stress, high temperatures, low temperatures, temperature cycles, maybe in combination with, uh, with some power supply variations. You need to have a bird that has the ability to do that. So we developed a bird, the ML4054B, which is a bird integrated with an MCB. Uh, and then the normal variant can be very easily combined with a thermal stream to subject it to the thermal testing. But again, if you start thinking volumes in a scalable solution, we also have a low profile version that, that fits into a custom door for a test equity uh, temperature chamber. And now you can subject multiple DOTs at the, at the same time to this kind of uh, testing. So very important uh, if you do this for incoming inspection or validation of your uh, supplier, and if you need to have a scalable uh, solution. So, so with that, I would like to uh, to turn it over uh, to our, um, our our demo, and um, so Hani Dao is going to do um, the demo. He is a, a very seasoned uh, person. He spent a lot of time in the data hall testing uh, pluggables, so he really knows what what he's talking about. So, you know, without further ado, Hani, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Case, for the interlude. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us. You know, finally, 400 gig is really upon us in full swing. Um, we're no longer just talking about getting DSPs into a state where they can go to mass production. We're talking about massive de deployments. We're talking about optics that are failing. We're talking about cost competitiveness. And I see a lot of folks, you know, attending this, uh, this call here. And 400 gig is gonna mean different things to, to different people here. You know, we, I know that some of you guys are focused on, you know, exploring production testing solutions for your own 400 gig programs. Some of you guys are starting to deal with 400 gig module failures in your own data centers, and you need to figure out a nice way to do a post-mortem analysis. And of course, some of you folks need to figure out a way to, you know, ensure that the vendor spec, the, what's the, what your vendor is advertising about 400 gig performance is indeed true. So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to jump into the 4054B, as Case mentioned, this is our fully uh, seamless integrated 400 gig solution for electrical testing, everything from CMIS, BR, and FEC is covered here. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, but I'll also continue my little soliloquy here. Um, you know, we position ourselves as multi-lane in the industry to have solutions for a variety of use cases, right? So uh, some of you guys, you know, you just need to see the post-mortem. You just need to know what happened to the module when it failed. That's what we have the 7007 for, TX characterization, the whole nine. Um, and also, you know, some of you folks just need a seamless, automated, compact method to validate your transceiver performance, whether if you're, they're coming in from vendors or whether they're on your own production line. So that's more of the use case that we want to cover today with the 4054B. So we have a complete integrated API, which will allow you to I do a fully automated one-click test here as well. But the key is that Right now with this Thunderbird GUI, we are allowing you guys to have control of all those little knobs that determine the transceiver's performance and monitors for all different kinds of that performance. So um, we've talked about Thunderbird before, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce some of the, some of the new features we've been we, we have in the 54B version of Thunderbird, which makes it even stronger of a software product. So you'll see over here, of course, we have our eight transmit and eight receive 
uh, uh, channel configuration windows. But what we've also added are transceiver specific controls, things like output disable, polarity flip, squelch disable, uh, toggling your data path in it. All of that is supported, of course, because like Case mentioned, we've got that integrated MCB into the, the product. And here's, here's a picture of what we're gonna be testing. We have a QDD version of this hardware. We offer it in QDD and OSFP for 800. We have a 4 800 gig FR4 module plugged in, and we can give you a closer look of that right now. Um, so tr uh, going over to the RX side, okay, of course, we've got more of those lane specific control fields for the transceivers. You'll see, for example, if I hit output disable, you see that RX1 where I hit output disable lost lock and I'm going to deassert output disable and we're back. So. Uh, we also have a new adapter measurements window. Uh, these are showing the actual voltage and current monitors in that MCB adapter so that you guys can get a pretty good ballpark of the power consumption of your module. And to demonstrate what that looks like, I'm going to open the CMIS tab. You see, we've got a CMIS menu here in the window indicating the serial number, form factor, and CMIS compliance version of the module. So you can see it says CMIS 4.0. We're going to expand that menu. Um, now in the identification tab, of course, you've got the vendor, you've got the specs, of course, you see we have an FR4 class six module. Um, and we will switch over to the read and write tab. So as you know, you know, we are the MCB guys as, as well, we offer a lot of that low speed uh, static memory, that low speed memory map configuration capability in our MCBs. And now that is present as well, integrated into the 4054B GUI. So you can go to your favorite page here. You can read and you can write registers, including adding vendor specific private pages. We can do that as well on request. But I wanted to show you specifically the reset, uh, the, the control step. Of course, we've got all these low speed controls um, that will, once we toggle them, they'll change the module behavior a bit. So of course, when we deassert reset L, you're gonna see we lost lock. You're gonna see this little DDM tab is gonna become red. We'll talk about that guy in a second. But the key thing here is now we're noticing the current consumption of the adapter is now negligible. I can go back and reassert reset L and you'll see now with that read only signal initialized L is green. And then we should get RX PRBS lock any second now. And there it is, we're back. Now the final thing which is new here um, on uh, Thunderbird for 54B is the DDM tab. DDM tab is a sort of diagnostic dashboard for all of your monitoring parameters of your transceiver. You've got all of the things you can equate this to, let's say a log readout of a 400 gig switch, you know, transmit powers, receive powers and temperature, voltage supply. Everything is looking green here. And of course that green operating region is defined by the higher and lower limits, warning and alarm limits defined for each of the parameters in the module EEPROM. So when one of those parameters is violated, this will change, but we'll come back to that in a second. Right now, we'll do a very quick pre fec BR run to see how things are looking here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just enable time, instant BR and real-time BR, and I'll go ahead and restart a test. Now, it's gonna take one or two seconds to reset to make sure everything's locked, and then we get started. Now you can see eight BR lines showing the real-time and instant BR. But remember, the graphic capability of Thunderbird is still very, very present in uh, the 54B. So I can add instant error counts, accumulated error counts, real-time BR, MSB, LSB, all of this really uh, visually engaging uh, stuff. So um, I'm going to remove some of those. I'm just going to keep the BER statistics and I'll flip open the details tab. So here we see a lot of information about the module parameters, right? But I can choose, you know what? I just want to see maybe the time, real time and instant BR. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let's say I see, hey, you know, channels two and four are on the higher side for the BR. So I only care about channels two and four right now. I'm going to hide those other channels. So now we're only focusing on these two guys right here and I can also collapse 
the irrelevant channels on the details tab dashboard itself. So now I'm just going to go do that for good measure. And I want to remind you guys that we designed this GUI, whether it's for the 54B or our other flagship birds to, to capture error bursts in PAM4 designs with very, very high resolution. So let's pretend, okay, you guys started a test, but you had to get pulled away into a meeting. You stepped away from your test station for a little bit. Let's emulate, let's say an aggressive error burst with our error injection capability. Let's go ahead and just do that. I'm just going to inject some LSB errors for a couple of seconds. And now you see on channel four, which was the victim channel, we suddenly see this huge burst of error activity. So what do we do with high resolution error tracking to ensure you know exactly what's happening here? Let's first do some zooming in, let's enhance. Okay, now what I'm going to do, okay, I came back from my meeting, I see this error burst. I wanna know what happened, okay? I'm going to turn on history navigation. History navigation is really a tool that allows us to go back in time in our tests and see at any point in every 100 millisecond interval, what was the instantaneous and cumulative BR error performance, giving you a great idea of the nature of your error burst. So if we go to let's say 99.6 seconds, and we'll take just a, we'll just take a look at uh, channel four here, you see the real-time BR is pretty good prefect. It's you know 1.5 E minus eight. But if we drag that cursor around to where the error burst started to occur, now you see that instant BR is much higher. It's the order of minus four. And I can keep dragging that cursor along the error event. And then you see, of course, the real-time BR is starting to catch up with that instant BR getting worse, minus six, and getting worse, minus six, and minus, minus six again. Now, what happened? a couple seconds later, right? Because I only turned on error injection for two seconds. At the 101th second or 101st second, you'll see my instant BR gets back to the expected value of around 1E minus eight, but my real-time BR is still accumulative. It's still affected by that error burst. So it's still in the 1E minus six region. I'll go ahead and auto scale to zoom back out. And then I'll get to those other channels. So you see what the error burst looks like relative to the other guys. And that's how we monitor error bursts with what we believe to be an industry leading, very high resolution error tracking software. So another thing I wanna show you, you know, we are running Thunderbird 2.0. 2.0 introduced a lot of enhancements for the entire BERT lineup. One of which of course is the, is the graph, is the table rather. We have the graph and now we've introduced a table to monitor the BER in a more traditional old school format. And of course we can add all those in measurements that we had in the graph equally in the table. Another cool feature here, of course, is the save data function. So anytime in the test, you can take this uh, table and you can save it onto your desktop in a CSV format. And then that you can post into your own Excel sheets. And you know we've gotten a lot of good customer feedback about that. So glad that we're now supporting the save data in the table mode. So. Now let's take a good look at our prefect BRs. Of course, we're gonna have uh, one of our channels, which is channel four, is showing a bit higher uh, BR than expected because of the errors we injected, but hey, everything's good, everything's green. This optic would probably do fine in a data center environment, but you know that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about how we can characterize those marginal performances, those environments where the optic is subjected to more stress. So now I'm going to ask my colleagues in the lab to add some attenuation to the optical span as we look at the DDM uh, dashboard. So what you're about to see is you're going to see all of the RX powers go to minus 40 dBm. And now you can see we've got that red alarm signal, that red alarm indicating those RX powers exceeded the alarm threshold defined by the module EE prompt. In a couple of seconds, we're gonna see probably we're gonna see that, uh, that red alarm get deasserted once uh, we plug in the attenuators here. I think we're gonna add around nine or, or let's say nine or 10 dB of attenuation. Um, gents, if you don't mind, maybe we could take off one or two dB so that we could get that lock back. Let's make it around uh, maybe minus eight, minus nine dBm. Um, but right now what you can see is as that attenuation gets less and less, 
uh, and we're going to show you in a second, what's going to happen is some of those RX powers are going to not be in the alarm region, but they're going to be in the warning region, right? So now you can see, right, we've added a bit of stress and that RX power is zero, you can see how it's kind of flashing in that warning region. And that means that we're going to show an amber indicator. But I think what we have right now is good to show a more stressful optic or an optic that's closer to maybe the failing region so that we can show you how we are able to capture that. Let's start the BR again, this time just in table mode. And you can see our prefect BR range before the attenuation was in the minus 11 to minus nine, minus eight region, where now we're firmly in the minus seven to minus six region. So remember, um, that's still within a good region of operation, but it's not enough for us to tell you pass or fail sometimes. We need to tell you how much of a pass, how much of a fail are we dealing with here? And of course, the only way in the industry standard way to be able to demonstrate that to you is FEC. The 54B, the ML 4054B supports real hardware encoding and decoding of FEC idle ethernet packets. This is this implementation is, a, is virtually identical to the implementation in let's say protocol aware uh, testers in the industry or even industry standard 400 gig ASICs and switches. So, which means if I was to enable FEC here, we'll go ahead and enable four by 100 gig FEC with idle packets. Now you're going to see um, the eight channels are grouped into four, four buckets, four FEC lanes. So what's the most exciting thing about real FEC on the multi-lane hardware is that if you plug the module into this BERT right now, then you plugged it, to, then you routed it to a module plugged into a switch and both of them have the same FEC setting, they would link up together. And that is what a lot of, you know, other solutions out there that claim to have FEC analysis, that's something that they just can't do. But let's actually get started and show you some of the new FEC analysis capabilities in Thunderbird 2.0. So I'm gonna go ahead and start a test. And then what I'll do once that test kind of gets rolling is I will show you on the FEC tab, okay, what are we trying to track here? We're showing the instant and accumulated measurements, remember? So we have the processed code word count. Okay, not very exciting. Instant corrected code word count, accumulated corrected code word count, and of course, accumulated processed code word count. And then again, in the details tab, we're going to be able to reliably track instantaneously or cumulatively the code word correction behavior on each of the fact lanes over time. But I want to focus a bit more, and of course we have this in, in, in table mode as well, but I want to focus a bit more on table mode with this with SER. So right now, because we added a bit of attenuation, you are able to see a fact tail. And what, when we say a fact tail on the SER graph, we're saying for every code word, for every fact code word that we process, that we capture in the BERT fact decoder, we are able to say how many of these code words have one symbol error, how many of them have two symbol errors, three symbol errors, all the way up to 15 symbol errors. And by and remember, with KPFEC, we can correct up to 15 symbol errors per code word. But you're not going to be happy if you're if you're seeing a lot of action, let's say on the on the quote hairy edge here, and you're close to committing uncorrected code words. What you want to see is a lot of margin here in between the highest number of corrected code, uh, the highest number of symbol errors per a corrected code word and the symbol error limit, which again is 15 here. So how do we visualize that with Thunderbird? In the new table tab, we are actually able to show you besides the SCR symbol uh, table, which you know everybody's familiar with, we have a new measurement, which is called SER margin. So the SER margin is essentially a buffer indication of how many more symbol errors can each FEC link handle before it starts committing those uncorrectable code words. And typically what you expect to see is roughly, you know, when you're subjecting an optic to a lot of, uh, you know, attenuation and stress, you're gonna be, be seeing behavior in the region of decreasing by order of magnitude of 10 from symbol error one to two to three. And that's kind of what we see here. So, 
and Thunderbird 2.0 with the 4054B, we have a new SER table. We have a updated graph, which will allow you to show that SER margin. And of course, that fecktail is what we all want to see. We all want our pluggable DUTs to have as short a fecktail as possible. And we are offering the ideal test vehicle to ensure that your transceivers are operating with that prefec and postfec margin. So maybe before we end the demo, let's see if there are any questions related to the performance. Um, we got a question who, uh, from, from an anonymous attendee asking about Thunderbird training. Well, we have a bunch of documentation uh, online, like our user guide, in addition to uh, a couple of videos on our YouTube account, you know, Thunderbird walkthroughs or our Thunderbird webinar, which we did late last year. Uh, so a combination of those, as well as our uh, superstar uh, FAE support team will ensure that you guys have all the information you need, you need to get started. And another thing that I wanna focus on here, you know, we, we have a mode which enables, let's say an external adapter. Let's say, okay, you wanted to use our MCB, our ML4054B for your module testing, but you had some of your own I2C read and write protocols you wanted to do. We can enable the, app, the adapter to act like a standalone box, completely separate from the BERT GUI. So when we go into external adapter mode, you can either, you can feed in your external I2C but you can also feed in your external power supply, which means we're offering you to, we're offering you the ability to own your own I2C transactions. If you have some sort of automation that you want to do with your own eval kit or to do voltage margining, you know, set a high voltage to the module, set a low voltage to the module. And finally, tying that all together as Case indicated in his, um, his slide deck, we, offer this BERT in different form factors to either mount a thermal stream right on top of the MCB or to have it in a low profile version which mounts directly into a test equity thermal chamber. So think of all these knobs that we are providing to you guys to be able to figure out what settings and what settings does my optic thrive and what settings does my optic come close to failing. So the combination of all these inputs and all these parameters that we're indicating through DDM, post FEC, through CMIS, really makes this a comprehensive, seamless BERT test platform. And uh, thanks for listening to the demo. And we're gonna hand it back to you, Case. All right, honey, thank you very much. Man, you make it look so, so easy and, and, and powerful as well. I mean, I think this is one of the key challenges that we, that we have in, in the test and measurement world. You know, we need to, provide advanced capabilities, but it can't be too complicated. So I think in, in Thunderbird, we came up with a user interface that has the, the powerful tools, but it's really intuitive and easy to use. At least uh, it looks like it when you use it, honey. So good job and thanks for that. Um, you know, just a couple of quick things. So I just wanted to share um, one last slide with the audience. Let me see whether you guys can see it. To reshare, yeah. Okay. Case, I just wanted to interrupt very quickly. Uh, we have some some raised hands in the audience, folks. Yeah, well, uh, if well, you'd like to, yeah, yeah, if you'd like to maybe put your questions in in the queue for the Q and A, and then we can uh, we can get to them. Yeah, no, that, that's a good idea. I was going to say, like, you know, let's do this quick slide uh, as a as a closing remark, and then uh, please enter your your questions in in the Q and A tab. Uh, we'll we'll try to get to them um, at the end. So obviously people are always asking, you know, what, what, is, what, what is next? And uh, as we know, the, you know, the, uh, the technology evolution is, is not stopping. There's a lot of new things happening. Um, the demand for bandwidth is, 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 is insatiable. Um, you know, and a lot of people are planning for the, for the next phase. So if you look at the, the technology adoption curve, of course, 100G, you know, still high, but going down 400G, ramping up the next phase is really 800G. And, you know, it's clear that it's, it has passed the chasm. It's, it's, it, it is going to happen. You know, a lot of our partners and, and customers are developing, you know, deployables, whether it's optics, uh, cables and, and, and host sports. So obviously it's really critical 
that we start enabling uh, our, our, our customers. So we have already uh, a few tools out there that can um, help you with this. So we have the test fixtures, the MCBs, um, the HCBs, and already some, some loopbacks so that you can start testing pluggables, host ports, and systems. You know, we, we have uh, 800 G birds uh, available shortly that can start the R&D activities of these, uh, of these products as well. But more importantly, we have a couple of new and exciting tools that we're going to announce um, very soon. Um, and they're really focused on addressing the challenges that arise as a result of 112 gigabits per second. So obviously for these kind of ch uh, channels, things are getting a little bit more complicated. And there's a, a lot of new things that need to be implemented to be able to test that properly to really do the, the, the fine tuning. So we're going to announce a couple of exciting tools uh, really shortly. And of course, OFC is going to happen. It's, it's, it's virtual, hopefully for everybody, this is going to be the last virtual event because we really wanna see each other again. Um, but we, we are going to attend OFC, our boot, uh, 1435, we are going to uh, announce some of these, these new tools. There's going to be some, some, uh, some videos explaining the tools and there's going to be some presentations as well. So please stay tuned for that. Um, that will be basically focused on the 800G uh, evolution. So with that, uh, let's, let's go to a question and answers. 